we ended the last segment uh, with this question. Suppose we're looking at Mendel's cross of two spherical yellow F1s. Okay? Now, we already know the answer to this question, but we want to know, using the, this other technique, what is the probability that the offspring is spherical and green? Okay, well, first of all, let's ask this. Are these traits independent? And the answer is yes, they are, because remember, that's what the whole last lecture was about. Mendel showing that these two traits were in fact independent based on that 3 to 1 squared ratio that he got. So we know that they're independent, which means this, we can use that definition of independent probabilities to do this multiplication, which your book calls the mul multiplication rule. Okay, do we know the genotypes of the parents? And the answer is yes. Now if we're just using A's and B's instead of R's and, and Y's, then the spherical yellow F1's must be both double heterozygous. And again, we saw that before based on the lecture from last time. So if you don't remember that, go back to that lecture and take a look at that. But that's the result that we have. They're double heterozygous. Both parents or both parental tissues are. Okay, so we know that then. Now we could solve the problem just knowing that using the Punnett square. If you remember, we set the Punnett square up by looking at how many gametes and what kind of gametes this individual can make. And remember the rule is there's going to be one of these letters per gamete. So each gamete has one A and one B. How many different ways can you do that? Well, remember the FOIL method. You have a big A and a big B, or you can have a big A and a little B, or a little A and a big B, and a little A and a little B. So that would give us four gametes from this individual. The other individual also gives us four. So we would then have a Punnett square that's four by four, or 16 cells. Okay, now, if you count all those up, remember, it was a nine to three to three to one ratio, the three to one squared. And the nine were dominant dominant, okay. So that we had the uh, the uh, the spherical or round and yellow. So nine of them were dominant dominant. Three of them were dominant recessive, so round green. Three of them were recessive dominant, so wrinkled yellow. And one of them was recessive recessive wrinkled uh, green. Okay. So in this case, then we're asking what's the probability of getting spherical green. Well, we know spherical is dominant, green is recessive, and the dominant recessive then had three out of the 16 cells, so the answer would have been 3 sixteenths. Okay, so that's what we know, but now I want to show you how to solve it using the technique that we had before. It's much simpler. All we have to do is say this. What's the probability that the offspring is round, is spherical? Well, again, now set this up. All we're going to do is look at the A's. Forget about the B's. And we've done this Punnett square before. What's big A little a cross big A little a? Well, you know that. You've done that before. Or do it now if you don't remember it. But big A little a cross big A little a. What do you get? What's the probability that the offspring is spherical? And if you count that up, there's going to be three of those four cells are going to be spherical and one's going to be wrinkled. So the probability is three-fourths. Okay? Now that's something at this point in your career you should be able to do or even just do in your head. Okay? But if you can't, keep working on it. Just always lay it out on a piece of paper. Uh, and just make sure that what you're thinking is correct, then it will eventually get to the point where you can just totally internalize it. But the probability of spherical is three quarters. Okay, now what's the probability that it's green? Now this time we ignore the A's. What allows us to ignore things at a time? Well, because they're independent. That's the whole point of independence. We can ignore the A's and just look at what's going to happen with the B's. So now we have big B, little b, cross big B, little b. Draw that, sir, that Punnett square out. And you'll see that the, there's only one cell, the lower right-hand cell, if you go big A, little, uh, big B, little B, big B, little B. And that then is going to be the only one that's green. So the probability that it's green is one quarter. And what we're asking then is this. What's the probability that it's spherical and green? Remember, and is times. So therefore, probability that spherical is three quarters and green, one quarter, is equal to three sixteenths. Okay, now, just to remind you, I know you know this, but I also know that a lot of students uh, sort of forget how to do this, even though this is something you saw in elementary school. Remember when you multiply fractions, you multiply the numerators and then you multiply the denominators. Don't try to do the cross multiplication. Some people tend to do that. That's only if there's an equal sign between them. So in this case, then, 3 times 1 is 3 and 4 times 4 is 16. So the answer is 3 16, which is exactly what we got before. Yahoo! So this is perfect. This technique actually works. Now, Let's try it with a harder problem. Let's do this one. All right, this is the one we started with. This lecture began with this problem. Suppose we have two individuals that are heterozygous for four traits and they breed. OK, 
Okay, so we're expecting, we're trying to figure out what are the expected phenotypes and genotypes. In fact, in particular, we want to know what's the probability, just for example, that the offspring from this cross is wrinkled, green, tall, and purple. Okay, now all of these are independent because, again, Mendel showed that they were independent. And in fact, Mendel could actually handle this kind of problem too. And that's how he knew they were independent. He actually looked at all of them, uh, at least three at a time. So, in this case, then, that means we can use the multiplication rule because we're asking what's the probability that it's wrinkled and green and tall and purple? Okay, so start like we did before. <clears throat> what's the probability that it's wrinkled? Okay, so now we ignore the B, C's, and D's and just look at the A's. So big A, little A, cross big A, little A. Same thing we've done before a million times. It's that Punnett square. And what's the probability it's wrinkled? Well, is wrinkled dominant or recessive? Because if it's dominant, it's three-fourths. If it's recessive, it's one-fourth. Well, we know wrinkled is recessive. Okay, good. So that's going to be the probability is one-fourth. What's the probability it's green? Now we're just looking at the Bs, ignoring the A's, C's, and D's. Same thing. Green is recessive. Therefore, the probability is one-quarter. Make sure you understand that statement before we continue on. Stop the video, go back, and make sure you go through it. Because if you don't understand what I'm saying, then the rest is going to be gibberish. Okay, what about tall? Is tall dominant or recessive? If you go back to one of the earlier lectures and you look at where I laid out all about all of uh, Mendel's observations, you'll see that tall is dominant. Okay, so the probability it's tall would be three fourths. All right, what about purple? Same thing. Go back. You'll see it's dominant. Therefore, this would be three fourths. So therefore, from this whole thing, from this mating, what is the probability you get wrinkled, green, tall, and purple? All of those are and. So it's going to be. 1 quarter times 1 quarter times 3 quarters times 3 quarters. That's the answer. And again, 1 times 1 times 3 times 3 is 9. 4 to the 4th power is 256. Now look at that. The denominator is 256. So if we have a, uh, a 256 Punnett square, that makes sense. The denominator is going to come out to be that way. Now when we express the fraction, it's best that we reduce the fraction to the, to, um, the most reduced form. But if you don't, I'll figure it out. It's not a big deal. But at this point, it shows you that this is going to be 9 of those boxes. If you were to do it as a Punnett square, 9 of the 256 cells would be wrinkled, green, tall, and purple. Now, let me show you what these techniques are capable of. And once you really master these techniques, you'll never go back to the Punnett square. They're much, much more powerful and much faster. Now, here's a second problem I want to deal with, and that is, what would happen if we had the same cross as before, and we have these quadruple heterozygotes? What would happen in this case to give us a heterozygote for at least three of the four traits? What's the probability of that? Heterozygous for at least three of the four traits. Okay. Well, if we think about this for a second, we got to understand exactly what the question is asking. Okay. Now, we're talking about being heterozygous for three of the four traits. There's four traits. So we could be heterozygous for any of these three and homozygous for one. Okay, now that's the key. That would be exactly heterozygous for three traits. But this is at least three of the four traits, which means you could be heterozygous for any of these three and homozygous for one or heterozygous for all four of them. All right, so we've got to keep that in mind. But what do we mean by that? Well, how many is this heterozygous for? Well, this is heterozygous of one, two, three, four genes. All four genes here are heterozygous. But we could be heterozygous here, big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c, and homozygous, big D, big D here, or homozygous here, big B, big B, and, and heterozygous at A, C, and D, and so on. So how many different ways can we be heterozygous for at least three of the four traits? There's more than one way, right? Because again, you could be heterozygous for A, B, and C, and homozygous for D, or we could be heterozygous for, for A, C, and D, and homozygous for B, just like I said. How many different ways we, can we do this? In professional science, you look for patterns. It all comes down to pattern. In fact, I can't really think of anything else you really do except look for patterns. Well, okay, that's not strictly true, but that's really the key to seeing things. And if you see the pattern here, this question is very easy. But again, you look at it in the right way. You have to look at it in the right way. If you look at it in the wrong way, it looks insanely complex. But if you look at it in the right way, it's simple. Here is a way to look at it that makes it simple. If you're heterozygous for three traits, that means you're homozygous for one. There are four possible traits, therefore, you could be homozygous for. 
Okay, so you could be homozygous for A, heterozygous for the others, homozygous for B, heterozygous for the others, homozygous for C, heterozygous for the others, homozygous for D, heterozygous for the others. So there's four. But remember, you can be homozygous in two different ways. You can either be big A, big A, and then heterozygous, or you can be little A, little A, and heterozygous. Okay, and then there's four then of each of those, so it's four times two, which gives you eight. So there are eight ways to be heterozygous for exactly three of the four traits, and homozygous for one, and to that we have to add the one and only way that you can be heterozygous for all four. All right? Now, if we lay those out, it's fairly easy to see. If we look here, all of these on the left-hand column here have homo, the homozygote is big, big. Here it's homozygous for D, here for C, here for B, here for A. Notice everything else is heterozygous. Here, it's exactly the same, except we're homozygous now little, little, instead of big, big, for D, C, B, and A. Okay, so that gives us the eight. And by laying them out this way, you're not going to miss one. You can see just by looking at it that those are the only possibilities you can have. Okay, so that's great. And then, of course, like I said, we have to add here to this. We have to add all the four different heterozygotes. All right, now what we're asking then is this. What's the probability of any of these? Or, more precisely, what's the probability of this, or 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 that? That's what we're after. Even more precisely, what we're asking is, what's the probability of heterozygous and heterozygous and heterozygous or and homozygous, or heterozygous and heterozygous and homozygous and heterozygous, or, and so on? Okay, now. How do you solve a problem like this? You break it down, just like we've been doing. You break the whole thing down piece by piece. Let's start with determining this. What is the, what is the probability of this? Well, what's the probability we're heterozygous and heterozygous and heterozygous and homozygous? Okay, look at A. Okay, so let's go back up to the parents. We have big A, little a, big A, little a. We're crossing those two. What's the probability from that cross that we end up heterozygous? Draw your Punnett square if you have to. And when you do that, you'll see that two out of those cells, two out of the four cells, are heterozygous. Therefore, the probability of this is two out of four, or again, we always reduce fractions, one half. So the probability of big A little a is one half. What about this? Probably a big B little b. Well, it's the exact same problem, except we're using B instead of A. So this is also one half. Same thing here, except we're using C instead of B or A. That's also one half. So what's the probability of this? Big D, big D. Well, again, now we're saying, Big D, little d, cross big D, little d. What's the probability that gives you big D, big D? And that then is going to be one quarter. Okay, that comes from the Punnett square. So the probability of this is one half times one half times one half times a quarter. Okay, now I'm going to write that more succinctly by saying it's one half to the third power times a quarter. Okay, so we write that out and we get one half to the third power times a quarter for that solution. All right, good. Now, that's just this one, one half third power times a quarter. What about this one? Well, it's the same problem. See, it's exactly the same, except we just moved where the homozygote is, but it doesn't change what the mathematics is, because remember, x times y is equal to y times x. Okay, so that means we have a half times a half times a half times a quarter. So it's one half uh, cubed times a quarter. So there it is again. And the same thing, if you look at all of these, it's one half cubed times a quarter, one half cubed times a quarter, and all of them are that way, every single one of these eight. The only one that's different is this one. Okay, now in this one, we have half times a half times a half times a half. So in this case, it's one half to the fourth power. Okay, because again, big D, little b, d, cross big D, little d, gives us heterozygous one, quarter, uh, one half of the time. All right, so that means that we have to add that together, and now we have one half to the, to the fourth power. So the answer to the question now is this. What's the probability of this or 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 that? All of them are disjoint. They don't overlap in any way. So we can combine them using the or rule, which is a plus. This or this or this or this is plus, plus, plus. Okay, so we add those together. Now, when you do that, add them together, start like this. Don't use a calculator. You don't need a calculator. You can do this and get the exact answer. Here, notice, there's eight of those that are one half to the third power times a quarter. So circle that. And notice, we go back that one half to the third power times a quarter is just all of those. There's eight of those, so it's eight times that. OK, 
Okay? To this, we have to add the 1 half to the fourth power. Okay, now, look at this. What's 1 half to the third power? Well, it's 1 half times a half, which is a quarter, times a half, which is an eighth. So this 1 half to the third power is 1 over 8. 8 times 1 over 8 is 1. And then we're just left with a quarter. 1 times a quarter is a quarter, so there's the quarter. That's why I don't use a calculator. You don't need it. Then, this becomes 1 half to the fourth power. What's that? 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. That becomes 1 16th. All right? Now, add these together. Don't use a calculator. How do you do it? We get them on the same denominators. Multiply this by 4. Multiply this by 4. This becomes 4 16th plus 1 16th. We get 5 16th. Now, you're going to get to a point where you do that in your head automatically, like that. You don't even think to use a calculator because it becomes so obvious just to do it. But you've got to have practice doing that. But this is saying this. 5 16ths of the time, you're going to get from this breeding here at least three heterozygotes. Okay? Now, these kinds of problems, then, are the kinds of problems that are closer to what professionals solve. And once you can solve these sorts of problems, you can solve problems like, for example, the last question on the uh, uh, Mendelian Genetics Laboratory. And that last question is more of a realistic question. Actually, it's inspired by an actual question that was asked to a person who I know who happens to be a genetic counselor. And to solve that problem, which is one of the easiest ones she ever has to solve, you have to use these techniques. But once you get these techniques down, the Punnett squares are out the window. This is the way you solve problems.